All right. Welcome everyone to the fall 2021 FCI live series. Thank you so much for coming out and participating. We have a bunch of exciting topics this fall based on your guys' feedback and needs. Today was one of our most requested topics and that's owner engagement around store design. Where is it practical? Where can you give input? What kind of input can owners give that is meaningful and useful? Where are there places that you know, you really need to just trust your design team and everything and everything all around that. I asked the Seven Roots team to join us to talk about this. Uh, so I'll let them introduce themselves and what they do. But one of the things they do quite a bit is looking at site feasibility, store design, and well, as well as programmatic department design to fit with that store design. So with that, oops, I am going to hand the mic over. I'm going to stop sharing these to Joel, uh, who is with us from the Seven Roots team. So Joel Kapischke is here today, Nicole Klimek, and uh, I know Heather Lazicus as well, and I believe Kevin O'Donnell. And Joel's gonna be our facilitator. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go black right here and my screen's gonna go dark and I'm gonna hand it over to Joel, who's an excellent facilitator and uh, let's take it away. Well, welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are, or I suppose if you're watching the recording, it could be just about any time of day or night. So uh, welcome. We're gonna we're gonna jump in here. Let me just throw a slide up here and hopefully hopefully you can now see our we little slideshow. We can. Um, I think I want to change that to full screen. So we'll see if I can successfully do that. Um, I'll jump in, Joel, while you do that and yeah. say hello. Uh, so we are Seven Roots. And as JQ said, we uh, do design operational support for food co-ops. And uh, we are all here because we believe in healthy food access and community ownership and the co-op model. Enter your mm -hmm. meeting ID, followed by town. I think we want everybody to mute uh, if you can. So um, yeah, so we are a proud worker co-op ourselves. Uh, again, I am Heather Lazikas and uh, I work in branding and marketing with Seven Roots. Uh, we're each going to share a little- ID followed by pound. Otherwise, just press pound to continue. Dave, I'm Dave Blackburn, can you mute please? It's not Dave Blackburn. It's somebody else named it Dave. It isn't. I, I, I'm working there on it, you guys. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Lovely. This meeting is being recorded. All right. So we're going to share a fall fun fact. Uh, we're each going to tell you our favorite way to eat an apple. Feel free to chime in with yours in the chat. Um, and mine is that uh, my favorite apple is a crispin. They're kind of a, they're also known as Mutsu uh, and they're they're like a tart, sweet apple. Anyway, they're really big. And I, I just like them with crunchy peanut butter. It's kind of a classic. So Nicole, how about you? We're all gonna go away hungry, I think. Um, <laughs> my name's Nicole Klimek and I provide store planning and design, programming, equipment specifications and interior design services for Seven Roots. Um, let's see. So apples. I'm a very big apple connoisseur. Honey crisp are like my favorite to eat playing, but my all time favorite way to prepare an apple is to get like a Granny Smith or something equally as tart and um, sprinkle coarse sea salt and cheddar cheese on top. Sometimes I melt the cheese. Sometimes I just have it whole, but it's pretty amazing. And Kevin. Yeah, I don't know if Kevin's able to jump in quick here or not. We'll give him a second. Anyway, uh, Kevin O'Donnell. I'm here. Um, all right, fantastic, all Kevin. Right. Um, my favorite apple is a macoon apple, and I love Rafton cheddar cheese, two-year-old cheddar cheese with it. And uh, my role with Seven Roots is I do uh, prepared food programming and operations. And Kevin is operations manager at Hunger Mountain, which you can see he's in the middle of actually performing that function as well. So it's great that he was able to drop in during his workday here. And I am Joel Kapischke. 
I do uh, a board support, governance, leadership support, uh, project management. And my favorite way to eat an apple is um, when I was younger before I became allergic to them. <laughs> but I'm only allergic to raw. So um, I still can I still occasionally enjoy um, an apple pie, warm a la mode with some vanilla ice cream. So there we go. Awesome. Great. But but definitely, definitely all in on like the Granny Smith with sharp cheddar. Mm, mm, fantastic. Can't go wrong there. All righty. Well, let's get rolling here. Um, you you all were checking in um, with you if if we've had some late arrivals check in with um, your your co op and your location and all of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, I think maybe for each co op you could add in what stage you're in. Yeah, that's nice to know as we go through. So yeah, and also kind of pop in, you know, how many members, a lot of you were doing that. It's just kind of nice to know who's in the room and and what you're what you're working with. Yeah, and do you have a site yet? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and as we do this, we, you know, it's clear that we're, you know, we're focusing this on, on our startup co-ops. We've got some uh, at least a couple other folks in here, which we, we're happy to see. Um, so um, we're here to talk about community engagement and store design. So the outcomes that we are aiming for today is to understand the importance of the opportunity to engage with the community, especially during the store design phase. Two, understand what that process might look like and three, no strategies for how to approach engagement opportunities. Mm -hmm. Great. So today, this is what we're looking to cover here. Again, we're going to set the stage. So when we're talking about the store design phase, you know, what are we looking at? And for that matter, what defines in community engagement? So uh, then we're going to establish why this time frame is a unique opportunity, discuss a bit about what to expect during this time, um, and then talk about strategies for sort of leveraging this process in pivotal moments as you go through them. Uh, we will have time for questions at the end, but feel free as you have them, throw them in the chat. Because you know it may come up along the way that it makes a lot of sense to just kind of pop in, pop in with answers on that. So um, please don't be shy with those, but we will definitely have time for that at the end. And for the purposes of this conversation, we're going to be talking about the time from the day you sign the lease on your location on your site through the day you open your doors. While you won't be like technically designing your store at this entire time, it often represents a new period for your co-op that um, it hasn't experienced yet and it's rife with opportunity. Um, the day you announce your site, you've moved into a new stage in the life of your co-op. At this moment, you are entering a phase uh, where your time to recruit pre-opening member owners and support is now limited and B, where your co-op gains a new level of visibility and legitimacy. So at this point, we want to ask the question, what is community engagement? Feel free to type what you think community engagement is, how you see it. Let's get the wisdom of the room here. we got a bunch of smart cooperators here. Um, put your thoughts into the chat. What's community engagement? What does it look like? Ooh, I'm waiting to see. I'm waiting to see. This is where we need the Jeopardy music. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, by the way, to those of you who are showing your faces. It's nice to see everybody. You know, and another question that we can ask too to put in the chat is um, at what point do you think community engagement becomes really, really relevant? When do you need to start engaging your community and your potential member owners? Okay. Well, 
why don't we tell you what we think community engagement is while you're yeah you're i'm not seeing a lot there. of a lot of chat action okay it starts yesterday Ooh, i love it sheila yes <laughs> yes uh -huh. there we go oh participation in conversation volunteering economic participation wish we had done more earlier uh -huh. yeah Getting your ownership and community at large aware of your cooperative and the value that it gives to the community. Mm -hmm. Building trust and excitement, listening to them, getting them to volunteer. It's a continuous process. Here we go. Now they're flooding in. Mm -hmm. Joining up Learning with local farmers from the and community. producers. Yeah. Oh, lots and lots of good thoughts here. Great. Yep. Loving it. Thank you for chiming in. Um, so yeah, and you can keep that coming, but yeah, exactly. So for our part here, we're classifying community engagement as any activity that invites your owners or community to intentionally interact with the co-op. And this engagement can happen in person, it can happen online, um, and you're probably going to be experiencing a little of both. So, uh, as far as community, community engagement goes, sometimes it's critically important, right? Like you cannot do X, Y, or Z without it, right? Sometimes it's a nice to have, right? Like we're saying, it's always good, right? It almost never hurts. Um, and that's the point is it's, it's mostly never a bad idea to have your audiences choosing to interact with your co-op. So we're gonna be talking about planned opportunities to engage broadly and visibly. So the intent here through community engagement that we're going to be taking on as co-ops is to showcase our roots, right? Like this is, this is our key. We are authentic and we are of the community. And this is one way that we show that. So examples of that could be something like community meetings, online, in person, uh, asking for input, giving people opportunities to be involved in something directly, um, or even simple stuff like tabling at public events, um, farmers markets, things like that. One thing to be mindful of here is also managing folks' expectations, um, especially when it comes to store design and community engagement. We want to have a dialogue and we want to ask for feedback and ideas, but the board and leadership have the final word. We, our co-ops are not a direct democracy and um, you know, we're not gonna use the results of a survey to make an organizational decision. So we're, we're, we're gonna be a little more strategic than that. So um, community engagement, you've already touched on some of this. Why is it important? Well, it's, it's relationship building. And the relationships are ultimately what will bring the co-op to life, literally and figuratively. Why now? Why at this stage? Nicole? Well, it's an opportunity. Uh, right now, your stage is tangible. Uh, your co-op has gone from being just a concept to a real location uh, overnight. You know, or, you know, over five years, just kind of depending on how people are able to see that. But the site actually provides proof that this is actually happening. And it's really a turning point for doubters. And so you have this unique opportunity to grow your ownership pre-opening that you will never get again. Once you begin the design process, it's very visual, which is super persuasive for humans because we're very visual creatures. And we like pictures. So we find that... Um, you know, posting on social media and Heather, what would be like the most effective platform? Oh, use? well, I mean, you know, you can do it anywhere, but I was just reading this morning that um, posts on Facebook get 2.3 times the engagement uh, with photos than they do if you're just kind of posting on, um, you know, posting text. And, you know, that's a good lesson for all the time, but I think it's something that we think speaks to the fact that you know now is a great time to be looking to get people's attention because they like to look at stuff. 
Yeah. And especially now, uh, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, so it's really difficult, but also uh, offers new opportunities for your co-op to engage differently and uniquely in a way that will be like a lasting memory for people. So you're able to do awesome things online. You're able to do videos. You're able to provide member meetings to a broader um you know, reach, you're able to get people any time of the day, and you're able to really have a lot of engagement around announcing your site. And right now, like it's, it's, it's shiny. And you've teamed up with people who are new to the co-op and they're new to your audiences. Um, and this work is a major differentiator for co-ops versus a corporate store. Like, you know, Kroger or Walmart comes into town and they just like come in. Uh, they aren't stopping to build like genuine relationships and learn what the community really wants and needs. This is the co-op difference that people love and value. I love that. This is the co-op difference. I don't know. Um, so let's see. The other thing we thought is that, you know, the big part of why this is an important time and topic is because it has potential if you do it right, uh, or do it, or if you do it wrong, for that matter, to have big impact on the present and the future. And so that can be in many forms, right? So if community engagement is handled well all the time, but particularly around your site, um, the capital campaign and fundraising that often come shortly thereafter can be sort of, you can grease the wheels for that, right? Also on the flip side, um, there's mitigating potential community blowback, right? So you don't know what's coming down the line. And uh, as you share with your community along the way during the process of opening your store, you're kind of, cre you're creating that valuable buy-in. I saw somebody, you know, call that out, Elliot, I think that was you, you know, and if you face challenges down the line, you'll have a strong foundation of support of folks who trust the co-op, trust the transparency that you're providing. In other words, you know, keeping these people informed builds community support through the twists and turns that you don't know what's there yet. You know, you're driving straight down the road, but you know, there's a lot coming. So, uh, and then maybe the most important thing actually is building your shopper base. So it's, we often think about getting to the finish line as the day the store, the doors open. <laughs> but I, I can say that personally, I've had that experience of, you know, you open the doors and it's actually the beginning of the race. And um, so having those folks who are invested personally, financially, hopefully both, um, they'll be invested in the long-term success of the co-op. And that's actually the hardest part beyond all of the startup rigmarole that feels really hard now, um, there's like a whole second leg to the race um, and building, building that buy-in in, into the future is very valuable. Great. Now what we're gonna do is we thought to really provide the right context to what we're talking about here, we thought we'd do just a quick overview of the store design process. What does that look like? What are, what are we talking about here again? So just be sure we've got that clarity. So just a, here's a little description of the design phases. We start with exploration and feasibility. And the project starts with an idea. This phase explores options and ends where the, or when the store has decided on the project it wants to do, like it has a site or a couple sites in mind and has a pretty good idea. Um, it, it has needed resources um, that are in the industry to help. Um, some of the key activities that would be going on would be, you know, brushing up your business plan, getting an updated market study or one if you haven't had already, um, doing your initial performa and doing a design feasibility. Oftentimes we will work with stores on figuring out which site is appropriate. You know, they all look great and on paper, it's wonderful until you lay things out and you start to figure out the design challenges um, that you have. So feasibility is really important. And then it moves into schematic planning. And in this phase, uh, the project concept is developed and preliminary costs are estimated. The phase ends when the store decides to do the project. Um, 
really, this is super fun for me. I love it. We start really getting into a space and laying things out conceptually. So it's to scale and to size. And we are able to look at the pro forma and the market study and your business plan and set sizes of say departments. How big should your produce department be? You know, it needs to meet your sales projections. How big does your back room need to be to meet your sales projections? And for us, it's like crunching all the data. All of that goes into that schematic planning. And what comes out is something super simple. You know, you have a site selection, um, you've got project planning process going, you've got your final pro forma um, and your market study and you have uh, store programming started. So it's really a simple thing that comes out of this phase, which is pretty long, um, but it's the very big foundation of when you can start bringing people in to really, you know, offer up their um, engagement and their feedback as well. Great. Then we move into project development. And so we have the decision now. We're going to proceed. We have, um, you know, a fixture plan that we are going to start developing. And this phase completes and details those plans. The phase ends when the architect is able to submit the permit set of drawings to the city and we can start moving forward. So some of the key activities that would be um, performed here are store equipment, like final specifications, working on your refrigeration, um, the interior design concept, you know, working on your signage and how does that work in with the fixtures and, you know, working the final fixture plans and where your hand baskets need to be and where you want peg hooks versus slat wall and all that kind of stuff. Um, I really, that's like, my my jam my bread and butter there um and then we start bidding whether it's bidding out equipment and interior design decor or it's your contractor bidding out um different uh contracts to like mechanical electrical plumbing and then we start working on those final project costs so that you have um like an, a working document in real life to know what your project has been to cost Awesome. Thank you, Nicole. Isn't see, this is why I let Nicole do this section and I'm just doing the headings because she's so passionate and so smart about all this stuff. So now we move into pre-construction. And this is the period between the completion of the project plans and the start of construction. Um, some of the things that we'll be doing is construction phasing, um, working with general contractors and your architect and your design team, um, working on any branding and marketing spiff ups that you have to do. Oftentimes, if we're going to add in new brand elements or, you know, really like beef up the brand persona, this is when we'll start doing pieces of that. Um, we'll do staffing plans and figuring out what, you know, training needs to happen. And then you're going to start hiring and training the staff. And then we move into construction. And some finishing up construction may continue, um, like lighting or soffits or something like that, but equipment and non-construction personnel are allowed in. This is when people can start seeing the site and seeing how things are working. Um, and this phase ends with the store opening. And so during this time, it's just chaotic, but amazing. And you have to have a hard hat and I love it. And super awesome. Your equipment's being installed. You're working on merchandising. You're stocking your shelves, final trainings. Like you're doing your uh, point of sale training and uh, you know inventory and it's just really really exciting up until uh, opening day and then we're setting up the store yeah yeah yep and then we open the doors and with all of this um we've got the warning that um every project's different <laughs> You know, this is how things hopefully go or might go in a standard project. Um, of course, there's not really such a thing as a standard project. There are things that happen more often than others. Once the design process begins, we work out the details, finalize the process, and we're always being flexible and adjusting as the real world happens to meet your store and your co-op's needs. And then the other thing that's, that's happening here is, is these aren't necessarily one step after another. There's overlap and dovetailing here. And there's a number of other elements that are also happening that kind of bridge between these steps of the store design process. So now we're gonna jump and look at that. Yes, and actually I'm gonna make one note. Somebody just made a, a note here in the chat. We did get a little mix up that we don't set up the store before uh, construction. <laughs> 
<laughs> construction happens first and then the store comes in but all of those yeah. things do happen <laughs> yes and that's what happens when your store planner just gets really excited and isn't reading <laughs> a script yeah. but construction first um you know and then you get your certificate of occupancy and like the and then we, are done. yeah and then we can move in the frozen food so there we go um there thank go. you so much um so let's see now now we're looking at this so that's kind of what's happening behind the scenes right those are all the pieces that you know you as board members leaders as gms that's all those are all the details you're going to know about um when you think about how this all kind of goes out to the community it's not quite like that right so they don't need to know every detail and they, there isn't an opportunity for them to be involved in all of those pieces. However, um, these are kind of, this is sort of the lens that we look at, you know, community engagement with. So um, let's see, getting started, we're actually going to start just before the vision and say, you've got your site, okay? And the opportunity here is we're gonna go through each of these areas and, and say, what's the opportunity, right? Like, where's your big opportunity to engage the community at this point? So first one is you got your site, right? Well, the opportunity here is to build anticipation around the announcement. Give owners an action item to leverage that excitement when they learn the news, right? So, so, you know, it's tempting, and we're going to talk about this a little bit to like jump right in with it. But if you can kind of build that up and, and get them to where you want them to go, that's a, a pretty big arrow in your quill, quill in your quiver. quiver. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> all right. So then once you've announced your site and, and you're kind of getting into the process, you're working on building the vision. Right, and the opportunity here is to gather input. And that input, it'll shape your store, but again, it'll also create buy-in with the community, right? People will know, hey, I was a part of this. I made this thing happen. Um, so then you're looking at funding and it's everybody's favorite part. And uh, <laughs> so, so the opportunity here is that you know now it's when you really want them to engage with their checkbooks and hopefully if you've if you've worked to keep them in up until this point then you'll be showing off this vision that they've helped to build with you and and perhaps some again shiny visuals some new stuff for them to look at and it'll create that you know this is really happening kind of feel and hopefully that will inspire them to, to dig deep into their checkbooks and come out with some money for you. So, um, <laughs> so then from there, you're moving deep into design, right? So you've, you've funded your project and you're really going for it. So um, this is where things get a little bit more nuanced um, because if it's being done right, again, much of the design detail work and those detailed decisions are in the hands of the experts that you've hired, right? Um, you want to engage and include your community in the dialogue here, but this is another place where, you know, managing their expectations is critical because, you know, as decisions get made, not everyone's going to love every decision and, and they can't directly impact everything. Um, but it's still exciting for people to find opportunities for them to weigh in on, on this or that and, and offer them peeks into what's happening. So, you know, one thing to think about here too is as you consider who, you know, you're gonna work with on this, you'll wanna talk to them in advance and consider people's ideas and willingness to bring your owners in on the process. Uh, again, can I like throw in a little, I'm going to throw in a little nugget there, Heather. Yeah, yeah, um, do it. One thing that I have seen startups doing that I think is fantastic is putting in their request for proposal or request for quote from different firms, what their community engagement plan is. That way, when you're working with people like or architects, 
that aren't necessarily really versed in working with uh, food co-ops that have these different non-corporate periods, especially during your capital campaign and funding, um, what, what, what are they gonna be able to do and how are they gonna be able to help you with this communication and um, community engagement? You know, Maybe they can facilitate something or provide a little bit extra um, and it'll prime them to be able to help you better. Awesome, thank you. That's a great one. Yeah, because that yeah, it gets you in position for that. Um, all right, so construction, we're looking, I think we did see that there's a question about examples of this. We're making that note and we'll come back to that one at the end that we are talking about examples of design, um, how to bring folks in on, on the design area. So um, construction, so opportunity here, this is the place for sneak peeks, right? It's just so fun, right? To see, you know, you can do before and afters. You can, um, you know, bring people in for in-person site tours even. That's kind of a fun one. And it's an in-person event as well. Or you could do it by, by video, depending on how high your COVID spike is at the moment. <laughs> and all of this, um, works to sort of build anticipation as you work towards opening. Um, let's see, and again, all of that is now serving this goal of building your shoppership. Uh, I made that up, but I like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, now prep, staffing, opening, so again, this is if you're going to continue sort of with the sneak peeks and whatnot, feel free to ramp it up. Don't let anyone miss out on the chance to get in on the fun. And, and now you're going to kind of be just like bombing people with this information because it's just too exciting at this point to resist. And as, this is where like, there's no waiting anymore. They can really grab a hold of things. All right. What? Awesome. Now we move on to what to expect. So what to expect as you're entering into the store design phase. Um, this mix will change as you move through the stages and it's going to be different for every project. You know, each, each unique project um, is a little bit different, but hopefully you're all going to have excited owners and you're probably all gonna have indifferent owners. Um, and then you're going to have the community members that are a little bit curious. They might not know what a food co-op is or the co-op business model in general. You're going to have, you know, the hecklers and the skeptics and all the people that are like, what about the green design? And, you know, I want to have this organic or what about these producers? Um, but you're also going to have interested public officials who might be able to um, invite you in on some network opportunities. And then you're gonna have just your general woodwork dwellers because construction is gonna be happening. There's gonna be signs, there's gonna be you know yard signs, places and bags. And so they're gonna to wanna to know what's going on. Um, and all of these things are okay. Uh, almost always the age old principle, all press is good press um, applies here. So even that heckling is really an opportunity for a positive spin and maybe a little bit to add on to your capital campaign. So let's, let's quickly look at each of these and, and ask ourselves, okay, well, what do we do with these folks? How do we engage with these different folks? Excited owners. Okay, I got this. Uh, all right, so perfect. Excited owners is easy. Let's turn their excitement into whatever it is you need from them, right? Dollars, likes, full shopping baskets down the line. So figure out, one thing we're gonna talk about next is figuring out you know, what you want from them first. So figure out what you're going to need your ownership to do and then be ready to kind of leverage that when you get here. And then we've got our indifferent owners. All right. So if you have really big news, there probably won't be a lot of these, but for those that you do have, it's okay. Like, you know, there's a really broad spectrum of how owners will interact with the co-op. And that will continue once the co-op is open as well, right? There will be people who want to pop in once a month, buy their, you know, niche product and then leave and never come back. And it kind of breaks the heart of us like core co-opers, right? We're like, why aren't they supporting us, right? 
but we're filling that role for them. And then there will people be people at the other end of the spectrum, those of you here in this room probably, who are, <laughs> you know, the, the dedicated volunteers, mm -hmm. the full shopping carts, and that'll, that'll be true now and it'll be true later and that's okay. And then we'll have curious community members. All right. So yeah, this is great. You know, they are your potential members. So welcome them in, be inclusive, assume they've always been interested and supportive. <laughs> so this is a place for like, okay, great. You know, best way to support the co-op is to join and, you know, in the future, follow along, you know, glad to have you. So just, just kind of bring them right in for a hug. Uh, what about those hecklers? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, don't be scared. So a lot of this will happen online. Uh, the activity will boost up your exposure. And, you know, when you respond to them in a graceful way, the negative interactions um, will kind of say volumes about who the co-op is. You'll be good. Skeptics. Skeptics. All right. So they're actually really valuable. Um, and you won't win everyone over, but the skeptics actually will help you to learn how your message could be improved or refined. And uh, if there are consistent themes within the skepticism, you can get out in front and sort of change that perception. Interested public officials. Yay. Get names, get phone numbers, keep them in the loop. Yeah, you might not always have the results that Bethlehem got, but it's very valuable. <laughs> Try. And general woodwork dwellers. Ah, yeah. So as people come out and they become suddenly interested in your project, it's kind of easy to be suspicious, right? Like, where were you for the last seven years while we were trying to wrestle up owners? Um, but it might, and it might feel like they're here to capitalize on your hard work, but assume good intent. Uh, take every connection as a positive. Uh, the co-op will need lots of friends as you move forward. Awesome. Okay. Should we, uh, should we jump back and give examples now? I think we should. Yeah. All righty. Sure. So we were talking about examples of engagement during the design phase in particular. Now, Nicole, I was thinking of, you've talked about how you worked with uh, a store in the Midwest and you were working on interior design and you had a slate of choices that were you know, going to fit with what you were doing, um, but, but there were options. So, so it wasn't giving too much you know, carte blanche to a group, but Tell us a little bit about what you did, where you kind of like showed yeah. up and... It was really fun. Um, uh, it was actually a green top grocery. And so what we did was we used the opportunity of their annual meeting to get some design input. So I came on site and I brought with me sets, three different sets of samples. And basically they were different sets that the co-op and I had gone through and already approved. And we knew that we're going to look good together. And we had people build their own co-op essentially. You know, they had wood samples, um, they had laminate samples and paint colors and pictures of equipment and were able to categorize, you know, one, two, and three, what they liked on priority. And at the end, then we were able to put those together on a board and be like, here's what everyone in this group like, this is the consensus. This is what we think that our co-op should be doing. And people then were really, really excited. And it was tactile and tangible. And, you know, I remember like the money just pouring in. And I stayed after for like an hour just answering questions. So that was a really good opportunity to bring people in, get valuable input um, and something that they can actually see and then remember when they walk into the store. And it was really planned. Like it was strategically planned. We, like I said, we picked all of these things ahead of time. We knew that no matter what they picked, it was going to look good. So then we just, you know, we did all the before work for them and let them do their job and what they were good at. And that's what they want. Is that the one you were thinking of, Heather? Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking of. That sounded so cool. Um, all right. So, and we can talk more about that if there are more questions, but um, all right, so 
from here, I think one thing that we we think is important to think about, we basically thought there are three questions that we think um, are important to think about as you move through these different stages. And the first one is actually, what is your co-op's next goal, right? It's exciting to have a site or reach a certain owner mark or you know whatever the stage is that you're at within uh, your design phase, but to be thinking ahead and think, how can we use this to set the stage to be successful with the next one? All right, then um, the next question is, what do you need from the ownership or community to do that? And the next one is, how can you leverage this to create that advantage? Awesome. Now we're gonna jump into some tips and tricks so just some quick hitters here. Keep in First mind. of all, don't rush. You have to make a plan. Uh, when you have an announcement, like your GM has been hired, you have the sites, et cetera. Um, it's really tempting to want to move fast and inform everybody, but your owners have been waiting for this news. Don't jump on the gun. These moments are moments of enormous strength and you wanna leverage them to the co-op's benefit. Uh, the next one is paint the picture. So you want to build that vision again. Uh, so learning from political strategy, you want to help your audience to imagine themselves at your store. You know, they're parking, they're getting greeting, they're finding fresh food, enjoying hot coffee and muffin, meeting with a friend. So the more you can do that, the more real this feels to them. Invite them constantly. Every time you communicate and engage, intentionally create opportunity for your owners and the community to join in and contribute. Whether you need it in that moment or not, you might not, because it, it might not be now, but down the line, it's vital to have everyone invested financially and emotionally in your success. And team up with your pros and work with the people who um, know how to seize the opportunity. Uh, when we're working with folks in this stage, we're looking at the whole picture. Sure, our most specialized work here is working with refrigeration and making sure the store you build is you know, gonna match your sales projections and um, the market study and build what you need. But we see the task of helping the co-op bring your members and community along as a key part of our responsibility. Anyone can Anyone? design a, go ahead. There we go. Um, Anyone can help design a Kroger, but from your site plan to your signage, you want to work with folks who understand who you are, why you're here, and why you're creating, and what you're creating. And this will really start your community. Um, your professional team, store designers, architects, programmers, um, prepared food specialists, the people who help you with everything else that you need inside your store. Um, people like us can be critical too. Great. Recap, we're coming up, we're coming up, we're at the past quarter of the hour. So um, we wanted to hit understanding the importance of the opportunity to engage with the community, especially during store design, understand what the process might look like, strategies for how to approach engagement opportunities. All right. So yeah, and again, back to those three questions. Uh, starting with when you have your site. So again, that might feel sooner than you're thinking, but that really is the beginning. Questions to ask yourself. What's the co-op for the next goal? What do you need from the ownership or community to get it? And how can you leverage that this moment to get there? And with that, thank you for coming. And we're going to move into questions. So Jasmine had another good question. Is there anything that is meant to be confidential or kept under wraps? Oof. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's a great question. And totally. Uh, Nicole, do you want to? Uh, it's going to be really dependent on your project. So you would need to talk to, say, a developer, if you're working with a developer or um, a, a landlord or an owner and find out if they have any confidentiality clauses that they need to meet. If it's a development, oftentimes, um, you know, the loan will say, you can't announce the site or you can't announce the tenants until you have 
you know, 50% occupancy. So you need to talk to those people first and figure out if you can and can't announce the site. But that's one of the biggest things that I see as confidential or under wraps. Mm -hmm. And you can still show people amazing things. Like you can show them pictures of other stores. You can show them site plans from other stores. You don't have to necessarily announce the exact site, but you can say, hey, if we're in negotiations, this is what it could look like. Yeah, that's a big one. So um, there's like kind of like a famous story that circulates the co-op world of a co-op that had been working on negotiations for a site for a long time and they made it public. They shared it with their owners and Trader Joe's came in and they were like, oh, that sounds great. And they scooped it right up and they took the site right out from under them. So site location until you've got it fully locked in, not a word, right? That, that's pretty common, but that's a good one. Um, and then what's, what's the other, I was gonna- Well, say. so one thing, it's not necessarily a confidential, um, but again, you know, be careful about when you've got conceptual drawings and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Just share, when you share those, be sure that the context is there, that this is like, this is what we're currently thinking. You know, this is not a contract. You know, when we share, when we share what the outside seating might might look like, it's like this is not a contract that we've signed with the community that is going to look exactly like this. And I would also make sure to let people know that they're not privy to all of those conversations and the months of preparation to get to that concept. You know, it might take four or five months to get there. And since they're not able to be a part of all of that, but they really should just take a look at it and be like, it's coming. That's the exciting thing is like, it's coming. It doesn't matter what it looks like right now, but it's gonna be here. Mm -hmm. Elliot has another question. I've heard that a bad survey can be detrimental. How do we put together a good survey to our membership around store offerings, et cetera? I'm a little I'm curious about to... more context because I feel like we could like really dig deep on that one. But broadly, Nicole, you Oh my gosh, I, I have a project and I can say because this co-op is closed, um, Hub City, which was in Spartan, uh, Spartanburg, uh, South Carolina. And we did it, a facilitation at their annual meeting where we had the architect and the developers and me and we presented all of these awesome things. And we had big post-it boards where people could put up color options. Right. And there was a member owner that put on there, I hate yellow. Yellow makes me tense. I can't handle yellow. We just cannot do it. Well, yellow ended up being in the color palette. I got so many emails from this particular member and a following up were behind them because they felt that they weren't being heard. They felt that they were just, um, you know, being strung along and asked for their opinion and it wasn't taken into consideration. Now, if it were just that one person, I could have taken it as like, maybe this is just an isolated incident, but there really was a following. And there were people that were upset with the co-op that they weren't being heard. And so I would say, yeah, it can be detrimental. You have to really think about what you want out of your survey and how you can use it. Well, and I think it also really helps when we communicate around the decision-making that um, you know, we were talking about those skeptics earlier, is that, you know, we've done, you know, as the board, as the leadership, you do all this work and all of this goes into decision making. And then you come out and say, here's our decision. And the first thing that people are going to say is, well, wait, what did you consider this? Did you consider this? What about this? But instead, if all along you say, hey, we're you know, we're starting to think about this decision that's coming down the road. And we've got, there's these various factors and we have a dialogue. So the people are already engaged. And that's one of the ways that we engage the community. Then when it comes time to announce a decision, we can say, thank you all for your input. We heard you. It was a difficult decision because we had to balance all of these factors. And we acknowledge the pros and cons in the decision. As we announce it, we say, look, you know, it would have been, you know, that property out by the highway would have been super cheap. And, and that was very tempting. 
but we're committed to a downtown walkable location. That's why we're announcing our site here. So we get out in front of the skeptics and the what about questions by acknowledging there were other options in front of us. And that, and that, that then we don't have to deal with as much of that blowback. Yep. Other questions? Any, any other questions? We are coming up to the top of the hour here. Well, Joel, no, you don't get to vote on the color you're painting the restrooms. I saw that question. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So no other questions. I, I wanted to ask you guys, I know um, you've done some really creative, um, what I've heard called a charrette, where you show people actual examples and, and get this interaction from it. And, and when I saw you do this work, Nicole, it was live. Is there a way folks can work with you or design something similar in these times when people are kind of afraid to be live that's useful? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we have done a couple of them. Heather, you'd probably be a really good person to talk about that. Maybe our last annual meeting. Oh, yeah. So we were actually, we're going to do a little shout out to, to Food Shed <laughs> right now. So we got to visit uh, Food Shed's annual meeting last week. It was a asked. fantastic annual meeting, hybrid, yeah. in-person, and yeah. virtual. If mm -hmm. anybody needs tips on putting together a sweet, really fun annual meeting, Food Shed folks, you should go check them out. Rusty has a really great picture of a horse in his um, in his screen right now. So, you know, he was the MC. You should find him. Um, so anyway, um, we did, yeah, we did an activity where we kind of led them through. We played a quiz game and we said like, hey, here are a couple pictures of food bars. What do you think? Here are some pictures of, um, lighting fixtures, signage, whatever. And we just kind of, we looked at things. We made it clear also, I should say at the beginning, this is just for fun. We're not making choices yet, but what do you feel? What do you like? Help us again, contribute to that vision. So it's, it's all about providing that context. And yeah, we can totally do those things live. And sometimes they could be more serious things, right? Like you're saying JQ, um, cause Zoom is a beautiful thing that we've all brought into our everyday lives. <laughs> they can be valuable for this kind of work as well. Yeah, and I'll say it may have looked pretty easy or it might sound like it was just, you know, this quickly put together event, but we spent weeks with the co-op beforehand, really strategizing and structuring each and every question um, and knowing what we wanted to get out of them. And I mean, we had QR codes that people were able to then participate, um, whether they were in person or online, and they got the results um, live. So we, after everyone voted, we were able to take a look at it with the members and show them exactly where their votes were going. And it was really, really fun. And people really, really enjoyed it and then had like a really good visual um, when they were able to leave the meeting. That's Sounds cool. awesome and amazing. I'm gonna um I'm gonna wrap us up here. If you guys still have questions, you're like, but but please do stay after wrap up. You know me about stopping okay. in time, especially when we're recording. But a few people might be able to stay after from our speaker group and and talk with us all. Um, if you have additional questions, I just want to take this moment and say. You know, what a jam-packed hour full of information. Thanks so much to the Seven Roots team for coming out and doing this. I thought it was really excellent. And uh, yeah, if anyone wants to give them a quick shout out in the chat, please feel free to do that. Um, they will be back with us. It's not on this list, but they'll be back with us next week on Thursday to talk to us about what's going on with delis. And from their team, Kevin uh, O'Donnell will be leading that, who's a deli specialist, although some of the rest of the team will be joining them again as well. And I think it's going to be super timely and exciting. Things are changing fast in prepared foods. But uh, just so you know, coming up tomorrow, how to run a more inclusive meeting. We got lots of requests from those of you who attended Nikki Jackson's session at Up and Coming. She's going to talk about some really easy stuff you can do both culturally and technologically in meetings to make them much more accessible on multiple levels and really that in that sense communicate the co-op's values. So I hope you'll join us for that. 
Um, and then as someone put in the comments in the chat, uh, this could be ours, will be next Tuesday. This is our only evening session. I accidentally advertised it as a daytime session in one of the emails. So it is correct on the Facebook page and the registration page. I apologize for that error. It will, this will be our evening session. Um, so this will be John Stein from the Grocery Story talking about his new book called This Could Be Ours with pictures of stores from all over the country and how to utilize it as an owner engagement tool. And then uh, emerging funding trends is going to be a really fascinating one with the culminating team looking at groundbreaking of the moment ways the startups are starting to be funded differently. So I hope you'll come out and join us for some of those. Um, and I sent you guys an email with a link to where to register for Nikki's session and to give us feedback on today's session. Seven Roots would love to hear from you about what worked, what met your expectations and so forth. Uh, if you have time to fill that out, we deeply appreciate it. And then I'll just take our last second here to thank the USDA, National Cooperative Bank, the National Co-op Grocers, and CoBank for making this series possible. We could not do it without them. So thank you all so much for coming out today. We appreciate it and we hope to see you in the rest of the series. I am going to...